Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to get to visit and hear about the research that's going on here. And I guess it's my turn to tell you about some of my own work on the magnetism of single atoms. And, um, but before I get to the actual research, I wanted to show you something fun that we did a little while ago. So uh, you may already be familiar with this. Um, it's on YouTube, so I'll only show a small part of the clip. Um, <laughs> what you see here um, is a map of some small <coughs> molecules on the surface of copper. And it looks like an ordinary optical image, but it's not. It was taken with a scanning tunneling microscope. Um, it's only a few tens of, of nanometers in size, uh, and here is the single crystal copper sample that this image was taken on, and that copper sample goes into the bottom of the scanning tunneling microscope. It actually goes about four or five feet underneath that table, and the STM, it's, it has its own room. It's a really big instrument. The room is full of electrical equipment, vacuum equipment, and all of that equipment is needed to be able to see a tiny, tiny part of that sample. How long does it take to make the image? <laughs> um, a few minutes. One image, not too bad, right? So one image or two images? Yeah, yeah, just the scan. Now, you know, getting to get that image, that's a different question. <laughs> so. But presumably it's all automated. So that is, you, I, I assume that this is made by picking up uh, your average yes. molecule. Moving them with the tip yes, but it's not all automated. You are doing it. You're doing it yourself, and I will tell you a little bit more about that. And feel free to ask questions. Yeah. So making the in, the the clip. So the movie itself is a couple of minutes, and doing that took 11 days. <laughs> so you know, 240 frames, 11 days. Oh well. <laughs> all right. So um, now. Clearly, the STM gives some very pretty pictures of the nanoscale world, and that's one of the reasons why I work on STM. But the other reason why I do, I do this is because the STM is, makes it possible to look for the magnetic properties of single atoms. So we're all familiar with magnets. Uh, they have two key properties. They have a magnetic moment, which determines the strength of the magnetic field that they can generate. And they are anisotropic, which means that there is uh, uh, that the magnetic moment likes to align in a specific direction with respect to some axis. For example, the axis of the underlying magnetic material. Now, um, and this happens because um, atoms like to align their magnetism, and they form small groups. They're called magnetic domains, and it takes some energy to rotate. Um, the magnetic moment of these domains inside the material. Um, so there is a barrier um, to changing the direction of the magnetization inside the material, and that's called the magnetic and isotropy energy barrier. And in order to have a stable magnet, this barrier has to be larger than thermal fluctuations, because otherwise temperature will randomize your, your moment. And for macroscopic magnets, such as uh, for example, a tiny piece of cobalt, like a one millimeter cube of cobalt, has a magnetic and isotropy energy barrier that's a million times room temperature. Now, what happens, though, is that as you make magnets smaller, this and isotropy energy barrier decreases. So, for example, um, these are some, some tiny lithographically defined bits that have a magnetic and isotropy energy barrier that's only a few times room temperature. And so this trend of a decreasing in isotropy with size is a problem if you're going to try to store information magnetically, for example. And you can, you can go even smaller. Um, you can have single molecule magnets. Um, here is manganese 12 acetate. These are some molecules that contain a small number of magnetic atoms. And 
This is clearly not a stable magnet at room temperature anymore, but you have some very interesting effects that are visible in these systems. Quantum mechanics becomes important because of the small size. And the question that I'm interested in asking and hopefully answering is, how far can you take this? Could a single atom be a stable magnet? And conventional wisdom tells you that, no, it can't. The magnetic moment of a single atom fluctuates too wildly for it to be stable. But there are some things that we can do that I hope to show you to get a little bit closer to this goal. And so to be able to study single magnetic atoms, we need a tool. And that tool is the scanning tunneling microscope. So I'm, I divided my talk into three parts. In the first part, I'll tell you a little bit about the capabilities of the STM, how we can use it to, to see magnetic atoms, then how uh, it is used to identify energy and time scales of single atoms. And then I'll show you uh, the experimental results for a specific system, cobalt on a thin layer of magnesium oxide, where you have a combination of factors that lead to a very large um, magnetic and isotropy orbital moment and uh, lifetime. All right, so this is how an STM works. You have two conducting electrodes. One is an atomically flat surface, and a, you have a sharp metal tip, and you measure the current that flows between the two. If the tip is far away from the surface, you get no current, but as you move it closer, at some point, quantum mechanics tells you that you will, a current will flow, and this current is in fact very, very sensitive to the tip sample distance. It increases by a factor of 10 if you get closer by one angstrom. And so it's this, it's this great sensitivity that gives the STM the resolution that it has. Um, so what we do is we scan across the surface and we try to keep the current constant. And as you scan across the surface, if there's a bump in the surface, the tip will have to retract and we record that change in the, in the height. And that's what gives us these types of images. Now, um, they're, they're usually called surface topography, but in fact, there's more information than that. Um, so what you see here is actually an atomically flat surface, except for this atom in the middle. But um, these waves in here are um, modulations in the electron density of the surface state because the STM is sensitive to the conductive properties of your surface. So even though we call it surface topography, it's actually a very rich picture of the electronic states in these materials. All right. But you didn't the, the extra spot. The extra spot? Which one? You, the That's middle the one? The one where you show the ripples. Oh. This one? Oh, it's not really a double spot. It just looks like that because of the, because of the, it's, it's just one spot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just one peak. Like if you were to take, it's an optical illusion, I guess. Uh, yeah. So it, it really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, I have a different color map very soon, so you'll, you can probably see that better there. All right, um, the, other, the other reason why the STM is such a powerful tool is because it, you can use it to move single atoms. And so here's how that works. You bring the tip in close enough to form a chemical bond to the atom on the surface, and then you move the tip across the surface and you drag the atom with it. And then when you reach the point where you want to leave your atom, you just lift up the tip and the atom stays on the surface because it's stronger bound to the surface than it is to the tip. And so maybe there it looks more like a single, not a double feature. All right. And so, and in fact, you can do this for um, many different um, atoms, one atom at a time, a couple of thousands of times, and build up uh, atomic structures. And this I'm showing here for carbon monoxide on copper, but it also works with a variety of different combinations of atoms and surfaces. 
And in fact, um, it turns out that when you're moving these atoms across the surface, um, there's an electrical, there's the, the atom is kind of bobbing along and there's a change. The current isn't really constant the whole time and it turns out that the frequency at which it changes is in the audible range. So you can actually hear the atom bobbing along the surface trying to get moved. So you're not showing the dragging along here? Mm -mm. No, you can't. Because you can't image while you're dragging. You're using the tip, like you get close, you're moving it. And so like you get some like noisy current. It, there's no way to see it. All right, so here's the STM room. Um, again, the picture that I showed. So there's different parts to this, to this instrument. Here and here is the sample preparation chamber. That's where we um, clean the sample so that it's atomically flat. That's where we have the, the sources of atoms that we sprinkle on the surface. And then here is a movable arm that takes the sample and puts it down um, about three, four feet underneath this optical table. It goes into the bottom of a, into the STM right here. And so that's at the bottom of a helium-4 dewar um, that cools everything to four Kelvin. And then inside that dewar is actually a helium-3 fridge, which cools everything to half a Kelvin. And inside the helium-3 fridge is an extension of the ultra-high vacuum chamber, of the preparation chamber, and it's in there that the SDM is located. And we need these low temperatures um, in part to be able to measure small energy scales. Um, but the other reason is because you want the atoms to sit still on the surface. So you, you need to cool them down. They would be running around everywhere at room temperature. And then we also have, a, we can apply a magnetic field and we do that because we want to be able to manipulate the magnetic states. And so finally, here is the picture of the actual STM. Um, this, is the, this is where the sample goes. So it's this surface over here. And then uh, this rounder section is, is an older version of the piezo that moves the tip close and that you can um, move it around to scan with it. And lots of um, electrical wires to be able to measure current and other things. Um, and it's always amazing to me, I mean, I guess it's still amazing to me even after years of working with this that the STM itself is this tiny little piece, but it needs everything else around it to be able to work well. All right, so this is how you get spatial information about your samples. And now the next part is how do we get um, energy and, and time information about the energy scales and the time scales of magnetic atoms. So atoms are magnetic because electrons are magnetic, they have spin, and they circulate around the nucleus, which gives them an orbital moment. And in these often cancel out, as is the case for atoms with partly filled shells, but atoms or atoms with filled shells. Now atoms with partly filled shells such as iron or cobalt, they have a net magnetic moment. But because an atom is spherically symmetric, this magnetic moment can point in any direction. And so um, you don't have an anisotropy if you have a free atom. But if you put the atom on the surface, the surface will introduce an anisotropy. Um, so what happens is that the Electric fields from the surrounding atoms break this spherical symmetry and they, uh, and they perturb the motion of the electrons um, around in the, in, in the atom. And as a, because it, it breaks the circular motion of the electrons, what happens is that the orbital moment of the electrons gets reduced by this ligand field. The spin moment itself is not directly affected by the surface, but indirectly because of the spin orbit coupling. So it's the spin orbit coupling um, that introduces the anisotropy for the spin. However, because the orbital moment um, was reduced by the crystal field, then the splitting between the states, the energy difference between states with different spin orientation is much smaller than what you would see for the spin orbit coupling energy for a free spin or free atom. And so that's why 3D transition metal atoms on a surface, you can usually think of them as a spin-only system, no orbital moment, and a splitting between these spin states 
that's, that's much reduced compared to a free atom. The atomic physicists here have, in the last years, learned that uh, when condensed matter physicists talk about spin orbit coupling, they are typically meaning something different from what we are. But oh. it sounds like you are, you are, in fact, meaning the same thing that an atomic physicist <laughs> well, <laughs> when we say spin orbit coupling. So maybe I should say a few more words about that. I'm sure <laughs> others uh, could say it better than I. Uh, typically, we're told, well, spin orbit coupling means, uh, to a dense matter physicist, means a coupling between the, um, uh, the linear momentum of, a, uh, mm -hmm. of an electron and its spin, whereas to mm -hmm. a, an atomic physicist, it means the, the coupling between the orbital angular momentum uh, and uh, and its spin. And it seems like you're telling us something a lot closer to the atomic version. Um, or maybe it's no, I mean, how the atomic version morphs into the condensed matter. But you, you just say a few more words. I don't think it morphs into the condensed matter version that you're thinking of. I think the one that you're thinking of are, are things in, like in two decks where you have electrons moving yeah. in a certain trajectory. Well, here I'm talking about the orbital moment of the atom. Okay. It's one atom. so. You know, it's like you look into the periodic table and you know that if you had a free cobalt, the orbital moment should be three halves because that's how you distributed the electrons in the shells, yeah. according okay, so to Hund's rules. Really is that, yes. Okay. For, the, for the value, yeah. if this is on a metal substrate, say, yes. what do I choose for the value of spin orbit coupling? Is it the um, free atom or is it some combination? Well, the, so, f if you, so the spin orbit coupling, if it's an atom, it's whatever it is for that atom. The, so the spin orbit coupling parameters constant stays the same. The issue is that the energy that you would get, like the actual energy that you get because of that coupling, could be almost anything depending on how much the orbital moment gets reduced. And you would have to calculate it very carefully to try to get the right value. And I'm not sure if you can calculate it correctly, and I think physical chemists might be a better, have a better answer to that. Um, but you can measure it, and then you know you get what you get, and then you can figure out that maybe your orbital moment is 0.03 or 0.1 or something of what it should have been. And you usually see it because your g factor value is different, right? Um, all right. So um, so then we can try and look for for measure these spectra. So basically, the and the this is some schematic spectrum of a magnetic atom. And the splitting between these spin states um, is going to be set by the combination of the ligand field and the spin orbit coupling. Um, and the width of these states is going to be determined by how well the uh, atom is coupled to the conduction electrons in the surface. And so if you put it on a metal, it's going to be very well coupled. These states are going to be very broad. And you get interesting physics, but you don't get stable magnetism. So instead, what you can do is you can put it on an insulator. Now, of course, since this is STM, we need to have a current path to be able to measure current. So you can't put it on, you know, you need a somewhat thin insulator. And so one example that was previously used is copper nitride, for example. And then we position the tip on top of the atom and we measure the conductance through this, through the system. And if you're at low, at low voltages, electrons can just tunnel elastically across from the tip to the sample, and you get some small but finite conductance. But when the voltage across the, the tunnel junction reaches a, volt, uh, a value that allows the atom um, to transition to the first excited state, then you have a second conduction channel that becomes available. So in addition to the elastic one, you can, electrons can also tunnel across the sample by giving energy up to the uh, atom. And so the, the second inelastic channel then um, appears as a step in the conductance. It, these are called inelastic electron tunneling IETS steps, and uh, they are symmetric around zero bias. And the voltage, the energy at which these steps occur, allow you to identify the, transition, the, the spin transitions in the atom. So here is an example for iron on copper nitride. You can see these steps. They're identified with different colored arrows, um, which uh, are sh 
shown here. Uh, they label what transitions they correspond to. And then if you look at how these uh, uh, steps evolve in magnetic field, you can tell that the iron on copper nitride is well described as a spin two system with a splitting between the states with different spin orientation of a few millivolts. And it's this energy difference between the states with different or spin orientation that basically gives you a measure of what the magnetic and isotropy energy is in, in, in single atoms. Now, the other thing that we can do is we can measure the lifetimes of, of these states, of some of these states. And the way that works is you simply excite the atom into an excited state, and then you measure how long it takes for it to decay back down. Now, in order to do this, we need to be able to distinguish between states with, between the two different spin states. And to do that, we use the tunneling magneto resistance. So basically, we, our tips are usually not spin polarized, but we, or are usually not magnetic. But what we do is we pick up a magnetic atom on the tip and then makes it such that you get spin polarized tunneling. And so based on the tunneling magneto resistance, like you're going to be able to distinguish between the two spin states because now the tunneling is sensitive to what type of, of spin the atom has. And so for iron on copper nitride, again, the lifetime is on the order of a few nanoseconds. And you can make it a little bit longer if you put, in this case, you change the symmetry, you put a copper nearby and you get maybe 100 nanoseconds, but that's still pretty short. If this was on a metal, it would be even, it would be femtoseconds. So um, we want to, to get longer lifetimes for these atoms. These are very short lived. And so to do that, we need to decouple them from the conduction electrons more. And so we do that by using a different material, not copper nitride, but magnesium oxide. Yes. Conduction electrons. You, you, you give it, you know, you have the voltage gives you the energy, right, for the transition. And then what the spin, the change in spin quantum number comes from uh, the tunneling electrons that, that can take up spin. And the thing is you have, you have lots of conduction electrons in the surface. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the tunneling electrons like something. How big yes. is this? Um, You've drawn it like it's really important. It, Adam, what? Yes. So that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what we try to do is we try to grow one, two, maybe three monolayers of magnesium oxide on a silver substrate. And the fact that you can actually grow it in different numbers of monolayers um, is one of the advantages of using magnesium oxide over copper nitride. You can't do that with copper nitride. Um, and the other thing about magnesium oxide is that, um, so for copper nitride, the atoms kind of sunk into the copper underneath it. So the magnetic atoms ended up being very, very close to the metal itself. But with magnesium oxide, it really forms exactly like one film. So the magnetic atoms is ab are about two angstroms, like really separated from the metal underneath. Um, it's almost as good. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of the best. That's why we, we picked it this close. All right, so here is then uh, what such a sample looks like iron and cobalt atoms on a sample that has regions with one or two monolayers of magnesium oxide. Um, and in fact, if you look at this type of scan for a while with, with some practice, you start to notice things. For example, that the, the trees in this forest over here are shorter than the other trees. And the reason is that this patch here is actually a silver patch. And so because everything is conductive, when your tip moves across, it doesn't have to retract much when it finds the atoms. Whereas in the case where you have an insulating surface and you have the conductive atom on top, then it has to be close to the insulator, but then it finds the conductive atom, so it has to retract a lot more. And so by looking at the various heights, you can sometimes tell certain things. All right, so this brings me to the um, 
actual <laughs> experiments for cobalt on magnesium oxide. Um, this is a characteristic IETS spectrum for single cobalts. Um, it has, there is indeed a sharp step symmetric around zero bias, as one would expect for these IETS steps. And it occurs at about 58 millivolts. Um, and just to point out here, compared to the previous one that I had shown for iron on copper nitride, that was four millivolts. So this is a lot higher. Um, and in order to assign this, this step, this energy to a transition, to a spin transition, I'm going to assume for now that iron is well described as a spin three half. And that because of the binding symmetry of where the cobalt sits on the surface, it, it has an easy axis and isotropy along Z. So it likes the spin likes to be perpendicular to the surface. And so in that case, the 58 millivolts corresponds to uh, the energy difference between spin 3 half and spin 1 half. And we can apply a magnetic field, which will split the degeneracies. And I'm going to rearrange the and the levels so that they're a little bit easier to identify. And now in a magnetic field, um, you would expect that this here is the ground state, and this is the only transition that should be visible, because this is the transition that requires one spin flip. So incoming electrons can give you a change in spin of one, uh, if you wanted to move to one of these other states, that would be that you can't do that in a one electron process. So you would expect that transition to these other states would be mostly forbidden. And this is um, the energy for the, for the transition that will be visible. It will depend on, on magnetic field. So as you increase the magnetic field, that step should move to higher voltages. And in blue is the step, is the data at six Tesla, and you see that it has indeed shifted to higher voltages compared to the zero Tesla data. But if you look closely, there's another step. There's a step at smaller um, voltages. And so we looked at the evolution of these two steps in magnetic field, and it turns out that they split symmetrically away from the zero field value which means that these two steps should be assigned to these two transitions. And uh, yes? Uh, I don't consider co-tunneling events here because of the barrier height, or why is co-tunneling not an mm. acceptable mechanism to give you a Um. You mean one electron jumping off the atom and the other electron jumping in? Yeah, or just tunneling through a virtual so the, I've been wondering about that, too, because I'm used to thinking about quantum dots. But the thing is that I don't think you can really think of it as the electron going onto the atom. I don't think it does. What happens is it's a scattering event. It gives, it gives energy, and it gives, the, and it gives the spin to the atom. But you don't ever change the occupation number, uh, like the of the electrons on the atom. It's not like it's actually localized on the atom ever. All right. Um, now, the, the presence of both of these steps, if you notice, I assigned the step, this step, uh, to this transition. And you might want to be a little bit skeptical of that, because I just said that the atom, this is the ground state, and this is the only transition it can do. But it takes more than 58 millivolts to do this transition. So then how is it possible that the atom is in this state at lower energies to undergo <coughs> this transition? So that's a puzzle, and we were, we were surprised by that observation. Now, the other even more striking thing is this large value of of the zero field splitting, of the, of the splitting between the um, plus 3 half, minus, uh, plus 1 half state. And the reason why that's surprising, that's huge. If you just have a spin only system, that's huge. Um, spins on surfaces usually are um, an order of magnitude to two orders of magnitude smaller splittings than this. 
And if you have a cobalt in bulk, then it's a thousand times smaller than this. So normally, so this is a huge, huge number for, for a spin-only system. And because of that, we thought it would be a good idea to bring in two other techniques. One is X-ray magnetic circular dichroism, and the other one is uh, density functional theory calculations. The XMCD is a technique that allows you to measure not only the total magnetic moment, but to look for the spin and the orbital moment separately. And this was a collaboration with three groups in Switzerland, and the experiments, um, the measurements were done at the uh, Swiss light source. So, so this would allow us to really figure out if the spin is three halves, as, we, as I was expecting, and whether the orbital moment is there or not. Um, so basically you have when um, x-rays are incident on a, on a sample, they interact with core electrons. And if they are absorbed and a photoelectron is emitted, you can um, you collect the photocurrent and that gives you the absorption spectrum of the x-rays. And for, um, for um, 3D, well, so for 3D materials, the uh, x-rays excite 2P to 3D, 2P filled to 3D unoccupied transitions, and therefore you probe the magnetic properties of, of your sample. And the height, the position of these peaks, of the absorption peaks, is characteristic for each element, so you can identify what your sample is made of. And then the height of these peaks um, basically is measures is proportional to the number of empty states. And then we use circularly polarized x-rays because left and right circularly polarized uh, uh, light will preferentially, each preferentially excites one kind of spin. So by looking at the difference between the spectra for the two polarizations, you can tell the difference between spin up and spin down states in your material. And so that's how we get that. Um, that's how we probe the, the L and S, um, and this difference between the two polarization is the XMCD spectrum, and this is what it actually looks like for cobalt on magnesium oxide. Now, um, the, this is actually a very difficult measurement to do on single atoms. It's usually a technique that's used for thin films, and you have to have enough atoms in your beam to get a good enough signal. And so it's actually an ensemble measurement, and you, but the reason why we believe that these measurements are representative of single atoms is because you see these sharp peaks, which you wouldn't see if your atoms would have formed a thin film. So first observation is that there is a difference in the, in the spectrum for um, depending on what direction your, your um, light, whether it's at grazing incident or whether it's at, uh, perpendicular to the sample. And what that tells you is there's a dependence on direction. And in fact, this indicates a large out of plane easy axis and isotropy. And then we can try and extract what the orbital moment is and what the spin is from these types of data by doing a um, atomic multiplet simulation. So, so this um, means that you have to vary your crystal field parameter and calculate the spectrum and, and figure out how you can ma make it match the experimental data. It has to match the energies and it has to match the transition intensity. And then from, from this type of simulation, you can extract the spin and the orbital moment. And the results are that the spin um, is very close to 1.5, which is what you were expecting for a free cobalt. Um, but it turns out the surprising part is that the orbital moment is not reduced as we were expecting. In fact, it's very close to the orbital moment of a free cobalt. So even though you put this magnetic atom on a surface and you would have expected the orbital moment to get quenched as it does in most other cases. In this case, it doesn't. And one can understand that by looking, um, by thinking about the symmetry 
of the, of the system. So um, transition metal atoms absorb on top of the oxygen on magnesium oxide. And so there are four nearest neighbor magnesium atoms, which would give it a fourfold symmetry. But if, that, if, the, if the bond to these magnesiums is weak, then the, oh, the, the only remaining bond is to the underlying oxygen. And in that case, it will have a cylindrical symmetry. And the fact that, that the symmetry in this system is cylindrical is supported by density functional theory calculations. So this is a charge density plot, um, a ver vertical cut. And you can see that the cobalt adsorbed on top of the oxygen. And then from the calculations, we can tell that the spin is uh, very close to 1.5, um, again, consistent with STM measurements and with the atomic multiplet simulations for the X-ray data. Um, and it, DFT says there should be about seven electrons in the d orbitals. And from looking at the par calculated partial density of states, you can identify which, or, which d orbitals should be degenerate. And so it turns out that it's uh, the dxz and the dyz orbitals that are degenerate, and then dx squared minus y squared and dxy that are degenerate. And these are exactly the, the orbitals you would expect to be degenerate for a cylindrical symmetric uh, system. And now we can distribute seven electrons among these orbitals. First, you put one electron in each of them. And then you have one electron that's left to be shared between these two, and one electron to be shared between these two. And I'm distributing these here just basically according to Hund's rules, um, which is a simplistic way of thinking about it, but it's a, it's a good way to start. And so now I was using d orbitals, but you may be more familiar with the orbital momentum eigenstates. I know I am. So it turns out that, well, if you recombine these d orbitals, they give you back the orbital momentum eigenstates um, so that, in fact, um, you actually have, because these two are degenerate, what, really, what it really is, is are these spherical harmonics that have the cylindrical symmetry. And so you have one electron in the ML plus or minus two state, one electron in plus or minus one, and so your total orbital moment should be plus or minus three. <laughs> All right. So now that we know that there is an orbital moment in the system, we have to think about the uh, energy spectrum a little bit, uh, go back to it and think about, OK, what does it really look like? So spin plus minus 3 half, orbital moment plus minus uh, 3. With spin orbit coupling, the spin will want to align in the direction of the orbital moment. So the ground state will be this state, and it's going to be separated by the state with um, slightly different spin by an energy, by the spin orbit coupling energy, which if you calculate for the spin orbit coupling parameter for cobalt, turns out to should be around 60 mil electron volts, which is exactly what we measured in the STM measurements. So, now I should rearrange the spectrum a little bit so it resembles the spectrum that I used um, uh, in explaining the STM data, um, except the only difference right, is, is, in fact, that you have to, to put in the, the orbital moment quantum number in your labels, not just use the spin quantum numbers. But otherwise, the structure is, is the same. You just have to take the orbital moment into account. And so this combination of scanning, tunneling, microscopy measurements, um, X-ray measurements, and density functional theory calculation shows how for this very specific symmetry, um, you, can, you end up with a large orbital moment, which in turn results with uh, what is basically the maximum spin orbit splitting that coupling induced splitting that you could get for a cobalt atom. Um, now, what this means is that it takes two times KT, so two times room temperature energy, to excite the atom over this barrier into the state with opposite uh, L and S. And so these measurements were done at half a Kelvin. So what this means is that the state is very stable against thermal fluctuations. 
Um, but of course, you can still get tunneling back to the ground state. And so that's the last question for the system is what is the lifetime? How, what's the lifetime of, of the uh, excited state, of the state with uh, opposite magnetic moment? And so to do that, we use a spin polarized tip, again, simply by picking up a magnetic atom on the tip. Um, and then we apply a sequence of pump propulses. And you may be more familiar with this from, from laser pumping, um, except our schemes are, I think, much simpler than, than those. So what, all, what we have is we have one pulse that is high enough to excite the atom over the barrier. And then we apply a small propulse to read out the state. And if you apply the propulse soon after and the atom is still in the excited state, you're going to get one, you're going to measure one current. If you apply the, if you wait some time and uh, enough for the atom to decay to the ground state before you probe it, then you're going to, to observe a different current. And so as a function, we repeat this type of measure, measurement as a function of delay time. And you should see an exponentially increasing or decreasing current. So in this case, I picked that um, if the spins are anti-aligned, I will see a small current. If the spins are aligned, I will see a large current. That could be the other way. It depends on your system. But the point is the two currents are different. So you should be able to see this exponential. Um, now, this is not a single shot measurement. It's not like we apply, we, we apply one propulse, we wait, we detect it. Um, for the same delay time, one, like one point along this curve actually takes many cycles of these measurements because your electrons don't always excite your atom over the barriers. But on average, you, know, you get it over and you measure what the resulting current is. But yes? I mean, since it's a single atom, when you measure, you get one or the other and then you're showing us the average or do you in fact get uh, I, I'm averaging over time so I'm sending like like cycles of these pump propulses and then what I'm showing is the average over time that you know if, if I if I wait for longer between the pump propulses in this cycle then most of the times I will get it'll be mostly decayed so I will get one conductance yeah. whereas in the other case it's but I guess what I'm getting at is, do you, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you don't have the resolution, but, but um, if, if you had some sort of an ideal system that could tell, OK, I get one conductance when the, the thing is in the excited state, a different conductance when it's in the ground state, then, I, then, then there's just two possible uh, yes. things that I can measure. Yes, but and then you would see a, like a telegraph thing. signal. Yeah. yeah. So is that really what's happening, or, or <laughs> is that something that would happen in principle that you don't actually It would know? happen in principle if we had the resolution. Yeah. Um, but we simply yeah. do not have that. Okay. If your lifetime is longer, then you could get there, but yeah. When you pump the voltage and you say you excite the spin out of the ground state, you're ignoring, eh, probably a, to a good approximation, any of the dynamics of the spin on the tip. You're yes. just presuming that nothing's happened. And the reason um, you can do this is because it's well coupled to the to the, yeah, it's the, the oh, oh, so okay. Um, so first of all, we do apply a little bit of a, we have to apply some magnetic field in order to fix the orientation of the atom uh, on the tip, of the, of the magnetic moment on the tip. But the other thing is we often don't just pick up one atom on the tip, we sometimes pick up 10 of them. So you wanna build up a little bit of like enough atom, magnetic atoms there so that you get enough spin polarization. Because otherwise, your signal is like really hard to measure. So the bigger the spin polarization, the better it is. Um, but you do, but you do assume that because it's a metal and because you have several of them, the 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 magnetic the direction on the tip is is stable and fixed. And it's just the one on the on the surface that's flipping. And you can tell that like sometimes if the atom on the tip. Is, is unstable for some reason, you get weird noise like, so you can really tell from your measurement that something is off. <laughs> All right, so here is what such a uh, decay curve looks like. Um, 
the characteristic time scale. So basically, this is uh, the, y, the y axis is proportional to current, the x axis is the delay time. We fit an exponential and we see that the lifetime um, of, the, of the cobalt in the minus three, minus three half state is about 230 microseconds. So that is three orders of magnitude uh, longer than what was seen on copper nitride. And so that's uh, one reason for that is the fact that you're better decoupled from the connection electrons. But one other reason for why it may be so long, if you notice, it takes a really big change in quantum numbers to get to the other state. So that also makes it harder to, to uh, decay. All right, now these measurements were done using a pump voltage of 90 millivolts to get over this barrier. Um, and if you remember, I had shown that data that had the, the, another step at lower voltages. So one good question is, what happens if you decrease the pump voltage? So you would expect that the amplitude of the signal to decrease. Um, and so if we look at the amplitude of that signal as a function of the pump probe voltage, we see that indeed, as you get close to 58 millivolts, the amplitude is sharply decreasing, so you get less and less um, of these transitions. However, if you go, it turns out it doesn't go directly to zero. In fact, at some intermediate voltages, where you would expect these transitions to be forbidden, you still get enough signal to be able to see something. So what that means is that even though the electrons can't really excite this transition, somehow it directly excites the atom into that state directly. So we, okay, so then if you zoom in to zero volt, close to zero voltage, you can see where this amplitude finally disappears. So the point at which you can't excite the atom into the state is at about 1.9 millivolts for the measurement that was done at three Tesla. And it turns out that 1.9 millivolts actually corresponds to the Zeeman energy, the Zeeman uh, splitting of those states. And in fact, we checked that the amplitude disappears at the value, at the energy value that tracks the Zeeman energy. And so we checked this for several magnetic fields. So what this means is that as long as you have incoming electrons that have enough energy for a given magnetic field to supply this, to supply this energy difference, uh, these direct transitions are possible. Um, however, even though they are possible, they are still very rare. Um, in fact, they are only visible in these spin polarized STM measurements. Um, they are not visible, unlike this transition here that is clearly visible in the non-spin polarized measurements. If you go and look for some step in, in the IETS spectrum at around 1.9 millivolts, you don't see anything. There is nothing there. So you don't get enough of a signal to be able to see it in these types of measurements. You can only infer that something is probably going on because you have the second step. And so this is one way that by combining spin polarized measurements uh, and non-spin polarized measurements, you can basically get all the energy splittings in, in your spectrum. All right, so basically this combination of various techniques involving X-ray uh, scanning probe, um, density functional theory calculation, spin polarized and non-spin polarized measurements, basically show that if you can carefully choose the symmetry of your problem, you're going to be able to get a um, magnetic anisotropy and a lifetime that is significantly orders of magnitude larger than, than that for other single atoms on surfaces. Um, and in addition, have this um, special case where you're able to, pre oh, sorry, yes, where you're able to preserve the, the orbital moment despite the presence of a surface. And here are the people that were involved in this work, the IBM team, um, and then the density functional theory calculation groups also at IBM, and the three different groups in Switzerland that were responsible for the X-ray measurements and the atomic multiplet simulations. <laughs>